Welcome to Rule of Thirds, a program on the Screen Refresh Network where our goal every episode is to select a different topic and create a memorable list of our choices. For this episode, I'm your host, Nick, and I'm joined by the rest of the Screen Refresh crew, David and Tim. Hello. I kind of feel like icy hot tonight. <laughs> I feel like Tiger Bomb. <laughs> Today, we're going to be covering our favorite hot takes. Is it still a hot take if my hot take is like 20 years old? But I only but but I only just thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was feeling spicy when um we we have our own channel and our Discord where we discuss, you know, the show and you know, it's just like our admin channel and when it came up of like, all right, well, what are we gonna do for the next month that we're gonna record for? And I was just I was in a fucking bad mood. I'm like, you know what, hot takes, let's do it. I feel like Destroying something beautiful. So, <laughs> got some hot takes on that movie. <laughs> well, now that I'm now that I'm older, I keep anyway, <laughs> I keep forgetting that Jared Leto's in it. And then every single time he comes Wait, up, I'm like, "What? Remember he was He's in Fight Club? Yeah. yeah, he was Angel the, Face. He that was, was him. He was the one. Yeah, that was the reference to the wow, quote. Yeah. I did not realize that was him. Okay, Holy so crap. probably not a hot take, but I feel like that is a movie and a book that is this weird cyclical thing of when you're young you're like yeah it's so cool and then you get a little bit older and you think you're cool of like actually it's totally not cool and then you get older and you're like oh that's literally the point of the story <laughs> it's like oh i'm not supposed to like them that doesn't make it bad that makes it effective well it's like um there's a thing that people idolize constantly like walter white people mm -hmm. idolize him for the wrong reasons no, and same thing with like a few other, a few other uh, pop culture icons. Where it's like Patrick Bateman is not someone to be admired. <laughs> it, he's not. Why are you idolizing him? No. Well, it's like the same thing with people who watch Whiplash and take it away as like, yeah, yes, that's the grind one. culture. That's and it's the like, exact no. one. It's like, no, that was not. No. That's not. <laughs> it's like ambition will destroy you. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that. That's the exact one I was thinking of. Because wait, that could be a whole episode of people like movies that the fans possibly have a wrong understanding of. Sounds like a rule of thirds. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I have two hot takes. I don't know. That's a hot take. <laughs> I am kind of glad I'm gonna host this out and be last because i'm going to take this time to pull a dean and Ooh. decide on i'm going to read the room as well depending on what y'all say <laughs> i'll go with my first or second choice because i do want to try to stay positive in this mindset but at the same time i know everyone likes to hear the dirt and the drama and tea when it comes to like oh what do they don't like like i don't know we'll, no so way. we'll see toxic so posi want... toxic positivity positivity <laughs> uh so do you want the video game hot take or do you want the movie hot take whatever one that you think people will enjoy more um then i will say if you think abbott and costello are not as good as like charlie chaplin i don't think we're gonna get much of a that reaction i mean you get a reaction out of me because that's <laughs> yeah uh, well i mean then by all means <laughs> hot take the internet ruined video games oh i mean a thousand percent yeah oh okay well, we're in agreement. Never mind. It's not a hot take. <laughs> well, I, I feel like it's you want to you want to elaborate. Yeah, it, it's only encouraged companies to release unfinished, untested product over the years. It's just yeah. turned it into instead of getting hey, there's 15 games coming out this year, and this is the final version. Unless we do an expansion pack, now it's here's a hundred games a month that come out, all of them unfinished. They will charge you now, but it will be like. Six years down the line, still unfinished, still problems. And everybody just kind of come to accept that at this point, which is kind of disappointing because it's like, well, you'll just keep getting patch updates and hot fixes every couple days for the next like four years. You know, to kind of go in on that, like my I, it's not my hot take, but it is one. I am fucking amazed that Baldur's Gate did as well as it did. Oh, I know. I right? am truly amazed. Listener, you don't understand. 
we've been playing this for the last like seven years not together and it was bad way we go to pax or pax east every year they've been there and it's like we talked to them before it came out and it's like when are you guys going to release this game it's been like two years straight where it's coming out it's coming out it's not out yet we download the demo because we foolishly bought it when it was still a piece of garbage of a product the game was unstable so many things were not ready yet to be played and this is a full release and it took them three years to finally be like all right we're officially done and then it's like game of the year quality like when the fuck did this happen well that's like one of those really funny things right because i mean i think the first time we played it or tried it at pax east it wasn't it was like a it wasn't if it wasn't even in early access yet yeah it was it was before early access because we waited in line because we loved divinity 2 and we mm -hmm. logged like a 70 hour campaign with the the four of us with dean um mm -hmm. and we loved it and so we oh, yeah. we waited in line to play the demo for it and then we played it and i was you know it, it was divinity essentially it was, i mean it yeah, wasn't really, it really any was. different yeah. um and yeah. then the they announced it was going to early access and i think all of us are kind of wishy-washy on early access i i severely regret convincing you guys to get the early access and try it out when it released because mm. i feel like it soured all of you to Baldur's gate 3 that by the time it actually did release none of you wanted to actually play it as a group anymore well i think we put like two four-hour sessions into it and then i, re I remember the the moment when we just called it was we were doing yeah. a dungeon and we went into the dungeon and the monster spawned and they just stood there <laughs> i mean we'd been we'd been dealing with crashes and stuff constantly but like that was the time where it was just like the scripted fight just didn't execute and it was just like all right this is this is this isn't gonna work out yeah so like we had already put like eight hours into it and yeah i remember my steam review on it was oh was that yeah the game <laughs> the game has been in early access so long i don't even care when it comes out now <laughs> like i was so hype and then it was in early access for so long i just when it finally like when it finally came out i was just like i don't care anymore like i was excited years ago yeah and and nothing you did like kept that flame going although every year we'd go to pax east and they there they'd be like yep. the same demo still this like, year ah um it is funny tim but now they have picture ops outside <laughs> oh yeah right uh it is funny tim i thought you were going to go with a different direction with this which is interesting because i feel the same but my take on that concept was slightly different i also think that the internet ruined video games but i think it's because it ruined the expectation of play for those games so like for example i don't think we can we can ever have another like banger mmo because of the internet and the way it is now well it's also a different mindset for gaming because no one has made like in the early 2000s, it was a boom of MMOs. World of Warcraft hadn't come out yet. And you had like EverQuest, Star Wars Galaxies. You had um, Guild Wars. Uh, Guild Wars. Mm. Like there was so many different ones where nobody really figured out the formula, so to speak. So there, the game styles and place and just like not even genre, but just the play styles themselves were so radically different from each other. And then once World of Warcraft hit, everyone changed their game or created a game that was just like it well I'm, I'm not i'm not even i'm not even saying that i'm saying because the the internet culture and how easy it is how much easier it is to spread information now than it was then is that the internet solves games before they're even out yeah yeah and you then as a player are expected to have watched those youtube videos <laughs> you know there's because, because like there... i i i have experienced firsthand playing world of warcraft the shadowlands that you know I, I for a while got really into doing mythic dungeon runs like i thought that i had a blast doing mythic dungeon like pushing keys and stuff but a new season would come out and there'd be a like let's say it's the patch like 13.3 or whatever when they do a big content push within the expansion and they release a new dungeon and day one running my paladin tank i was getting yelled at because i didn't i wasn't doing the op the optimum path and i'm like 
it is day one. And they're like, yeah, you didn't watch the videos? And I'm like, no, no the, I wanted to play the game. Yeah. I can do you one better. People were saying this during the closed beta. Oh, yeah. I remember seeing a couple like influencers that were given access into it. Some of them were getting yelled at for, you don't know how to play this fight. Like, dude, this thing isn't even out yet. Yeah. Only select like 2,000 players can allow, like, are allowed to even play this out of the millions that are subscribed. And of course, I don't know how to do this. Why are you yelling at me? It, it's a bit of like oh, the old man get off my lawn kind of stuff, but it's like, it's reduced everything down to we have compiled all of the data from everything everywhere because everybody is just, this is the best way to do everything. It yeah. takes all the excitement and adventure that we used to have in gaming of, oh, I found this, or, oh, uh, the schoolyard rumor of, hey, did you know if you go do this, this, and this, like, you end up finding or unlocking this. It takes all of that away, because now it's just shoved in our face between, like, videos and guides and all of these articles of, here's how to do the best, quickest, like, most efficient way of everything ever. Yeah, and if you don't do it, you, the, the community is toxic to you. So like, Yeah, you're if, doing it wrong. Yeah, if, if like I'm playing a Paladin tank and this is like I want to do this kind of weird build and it's like that's not the optimum build. Like you're you're going to cost us time on our mythic key runs because you're not playing the build you're supposed to. And it's like we, we now have this this wealth of information which is now creating player expectation and you're no longer allowed to experiment and do different things or like try weird combinations. I mean, in Burning Crusade, I was a Paladin tank before Paladin tanks had a taunt button. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it, true. it didn't work great. I mean, we I did well, uh, considering. Honestly, when you weren't supposed to tank by the game's engine, I felt most comfortable with Paladin tanks even back then. Hmm. Because you were able to figure out that weird gaming loophole, and it's just you essentially started the AoE tanking. Yeah. Without realizing that this is going to be the meta going forward. And then eventually tank like the classic tank um warrior class couldn't keep up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was like so it, it's, it's, it was like a yeah. weird like fringe thing that I was like, oh, well, what if you did this? Would this work? And then it did. And it was like, oh, that's really cool. But like if you were to try that in current WoW or I think most current uh MMOs, like you wouldn't get groups. You would just get kicked. Like yeah. you would queue yeah. up as a tank and no one would take you. <laughs> or like you would do looking for group as like, oh, I'm a paladin tank and no one would 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 join your group or take you on. Which it, yeah. it it's so ridiculous. Like even in PvP and WoW, you would see that that like I would be playing a prop pally um and spec'd to do like off healing support, which was kind of like a weird, really niche PvP build. And just get insta kicked because like you're useless. And it's like, oh, okay. Like you should be you're either holy or your retribution. Like your weird build isn't good enough. It's like, <laughs> oh, okay. So that that's my frustration with the internet. And just like a side tangent to that. It, it also like card games. Uh I play Hearthstone. I'm sounding like a a, a Blizzard fanboy at the moment, which I'm not. It just kind of weirdly <laughs> worked together. Um like a new expansion from Hearthstone, com Hearthstone comes out and the game is, is the expansion is, is solved in three days. In three days, every top player has discovered what the optimal deck is and posted it online and everyone's just playing that. So within three days, the meta just becomes these are the three best decks. This is what you play. And that is the game. <laughs> and it's just like it's just it, it ruins it. There's no there's no exploration. There's no experimentation with it. It's just this is the best. This is what you have to play. And that's what it is. Yeah, so th that's my side of the internet ruined games. But I mean, also effectively, effectively crippled couch co-op as a concept. Oh, that's true. It did kill that, right? Because I mean, then it, I mean, granted, yes, there's plenty of benefits. I've loved things like World of Warcraft, playing with you guys, meeting people I never would have, like a lot of the online stuff of being able to play with my dad back home while not living home anymore. But also it's now the idea of couch co-op is so taboo. That it's either tinier arcade type games or you don't get it all. It's, oh, do you want to play with a friend? Are they in the same room as you? Great. Go buy a second TV, buy a second system, buy a second copy of the game, get an online that subscription. I mean, for like my bachelor party and yours, 
we all had to bring our stuff. You know, we had six T we had five TVs to play Borderlands three. We had four like gaming computers in your apartment to play Helldivers. I mean it's yeah, you need to have all of the stuff and there's I mean the game wasn't great, but I mean Army of Two was an amazing couch co op game. You know, it's just one person owns the game two controllers sharing the screen and then it's just endless fun of just you doing the senseless you know the senseless missions and it's just shooting and it's it's an awesome shooter yeah. it worked great they don't have that now yeah and, and now that we all finally have big enough tvs where you don't really care about split screen yeah it's like nope now they're gone it's like oh come on yeah now my screen on a split screen would be the size of my tube tv back when we were playing halo 2 yeah i know right mm -hmm. now now that we've graduated to like 70 80 inch tvs from 22 inch crts yeah <laughs> i'm getting old i still have to sit like two feet away if we're doing that but i, I mean it is a possibility though i mean ui doesn't scale super well but <laughs> <laughs> so that is my thought take it's a good one I'm, yeah i'm on board with that yeah so my hot take is all positive all the time because as I found, I found that as I get older, I only get more positive. Apparently, it's really weird. I used to you like I used to be the crunchy cookies. Hey kids, come on my lawn. Soft cookies. I used to be the <laughs> the angriest, most judgmental teenager. Somehow, I left all that behind. Uh, Is heavy rain a game? <laughs> eh, if you want it to be, <laughs> if you like it, that's fine. <laughs> um, a twenty year old debate finally settled. <laughs> it's like eh. Uh, my hot take is I think any movie could be made better with a meta framing device. And let me explain what I mean by meta framing device is, I mean, the, I think the most well-known kind of version of this is mystery science theater 3000, which frames the movie in a meta storyline that the movie is being watched by a couple of robots and a imprisoned kind of science lab worker in a spaceship another great one from from my past childhood is if anyone remembers you know bless you if you remember this but on uh i think it was maybe tlc i can't remember the networks anymore there was also a meta framing device of a show called dinner in a movie that would appear oh, on friday TBS. nights tbs oh, yeah where you had this meta framing device of it being two friends sitting down for their Friday night movie night and they show you how to do recipes and things. And I used to love this, dinner in a movie. Right? Um, so I, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Mystery Science Theater. I think everyone knows that from previous podcasts. Um, and I just think, I mean, even Riff, Riff Tracks. Riff Tracks doesn't do the framing device. They just do the riffing. But I think it's the framing of creating this, this extra story on top of your story. I think for me enriches the movie watching experience in like a, a dramatic way like sometimes i will watch mystery science here 3000 just for the skits with the robots and jonah or joel or mike nelson or i'm spacing on the newest uh host i cannot remember her name i have to find that felicia day no no she's the the villain um oh, oh. for the for the most recent kickstarted season um they brought on a new host who was actually hosting the live specials after Joel retired from doing it. Um, oh, huh. Yeah, she, she was great in the live shows. Um, so it was really cool to see her kind of take on that role and do a few in the latest season. But Good for her, um, I love the framing devices. I think it's great. I think having a framing device that exists outside of the movie universe, but has its own like tiny universe, like little microcosm makes movies so much better. Um, and I think it works for any movie. I'm, I'm just say, saying that, like, imagine if you turned on any of the, the the Star Wars movies and you're first greeted with, like, I don't know, some, like, cartoon character who has their own little backstory and then is going to go sit down and watch a movie and it happens to be Star Wars. I'm just like, I, I'm, in, I'm in. You're adding, like, this layer of deep lore that's almost equivalent <laughs> to, like, playing Dark Souls or Elden Ring. You're like, oh, yeah, here's the story. But then, wait, what's going on over there? Like. What's that about? It, to me, it feels almost like a very adult swim, like too many cooks thing where it's like, oh, this is fun. And then it's just like all of a sudden there's this extra lore. You're not just watching a movie. You're like finding out this little like 30 second thing. Um, oh, another. Isn't there like tsunami lore? I was about to say like, like, there's like, a ton yeah. of tsunami lore. I was like, tsunami is another framing device in the midnight run where it's like you've, you've got Tom and he's doing his thing in the spaceship. And there's like 
you get you get them for like quick 15 20 second things but yeah. like it's building this universe that exists outside of the movies and the shows that you're watching but I mean, it becomes iconic they had like big summer events and things on tsunami where it was an ongoing storyline and like you have to go online and play the game and it's stuff is taking over the ship they had a bunch of different things over the years that i think was a really cool addition to it um but as far as like in terms of a framing device something like you said i think the benefit to it as well is people watching things alone then it adds that extra layer of oh okay so granted they're not with me but there is another entity experiencing the same thing i'm experiencing and then commenting and discussing it as opposed to just sitting there by myself and just okay movie starts movie ends it's okay i'm viewing it through the secondary lens that makes it feel a little bit more as a community feeling as opposed mm -hmm. to just like a one-to-one -one experience yeah and i mean i wonder if more people would be on board with that experience because now the prevalence of like let's plays and let's players like where you're you're not playing a game but you're watching someone experience something like you're kind of sharing in that experience very much like very much like oh, the let's play person is essentially the framing device for the game and how you're experiencing it um, yeah i also just thought of another great one that's going to age me really badly which is uh summer nickelodeon with stick stickly oh yeah um, <laughs> who would it, right who would, to me stick stickly p.o box nine six three 307 308 101 38 yeah stick, like, stickly what? who would like come in and he had skits yeah. and he'd introduce shows or even like nick jr had face that yeah. like burr, burr, burr. yeah had these whole storylines i think i think anything any movie any show would benefit dramatically from a framing device and i would love to see a resurgence of that kind of programming i mean right now all we kind of have is mystery science and mystery science theater and unfortunately their most recent kickstarter did not make it um partially because it was unfortunately timed with the writer's strike um where yeah, the, the, yeah, the writers and Screen Actors Guild weren't, because of their contracts, weren't able to promote projects. <laughs> so no one involved with Mystery Science Theater was able to talk or promote it because of the strike. <laughs> That's brutal. Yeah, so they're like, like, yeah, we did this thing. Does anybody know about it? Like, just the people in this room. It's like, we started the Kickstarter. Awesome. That's like, Felicia Day, Patton Oswald, everyone get out there and start talking about it. And then they're all of a sudden, oh, we, we can't, actually, because we're on strike. It's like, Ah crap! <laughs> yep, that'll do it. Yeah, they still got they still got close, but not what they needed. So bring back dinner in a movie, right? Dinner in a movie was great. It was only two seasons. It felt was it really so that much, short? It felt like that was like always on growing up. Oh yeah, well, it could have been like a syndication thing, and it helps too mm -hmm. that each episode is like you know two, technically like three hours. So the typical commercial. Oh yeah. I still think it's hilarious that Netflix was coming down on Mystery Science Theater for their second season. There was like, no, you've got to make Mystery Science Theater bingeable because that those are the stats we care about. And I'm like, guys, these are two and a half hour long episodes. Nobody's binging 11 hours of a show. <laughs> uh, except ours. Please, everybody, sure please listen to uh, everything that we have and catch up. Yeah, but not back to back in the same sitting. <laughs> I mean, I watched Fallout in almost two days, <laughs> and that's the episode. I, mean, I guess that's a good point. But yeah, that's that's true. But unfortunately, that's all all Netflix cared about for its stats is is the binge watch, not necessarily how many people or how long. It's just like how many people signed up to watch it, and then how many people watched it in single or tiny set, uh, sittings. Yeah. All right, Nicholas, have you figured out your hot take? I think Christopher Nolan is overrated and I don't think Oppenheimer and I mean, I feel everything after inception is overblown and they're mediocre movies at best. I'm trying, I don't know how much I've actually considered that. Oppenheimer wasn't a bad movie. I'm trying to think of everything else that he's done. Interstellar. I honestly didn't like it. Um, it looked great. Fantastically edited. You know, there's a lot of the special effects work that he's done. I just, I think he's pretentious, and I don't really like him that much. <laughs> I think Oppenheimer was an okay movie. Masquerading as a better film. Yeah. Like, was it good? Yes. But honestly, I've seen... I like that whole Manhattan Project. You know, the nuclear history and 
leading up to that, even before, I think after watching Chernobyl is when I did the deep dive on like, you know, on nuclear reactors, all the consequences of any kind of like failures, just like Chernobyl leading to like, what's, what is a nuclear reactor? And then like, this is how we figured it out. And this is like, everything boils down to that rabbit hole eventually going down to the Manhattan Project, World War II you know, fat man, little boy, and just like the nuclear detonations and all of the tests afterward. And there's a lot of great material on YouTube that was created that are just, I always like documentaries growing up. And like one of my favorite like niches that I like to do is like, I like the Discovery Channel a lot and like the Science Channel. I love those. And I really enjoyed watching all those documentaries that they would put out. And YouTube has a lot of great channels and um, just one-off things that have been made. Let's talk about that kind of stuff. And I felt they did a better job of explaining and showcasing what Oppenheimer did than Nolan did. Because I already watched this movie on YouTube, basically made by 15, mm. 20 other different creators. So by the time Nolan shows me his take, like it's not bad. But it's a lot of it I didn't already know already. And just the way that he decided to do certain things, I just felt it was kind of weird. Like, I think the sex scene between him and... Florence Pugh was not really necessary. And this is how he decides the I am become death destroyer of worlds. And I was just like, okay. Yeah. I mean, it was, I, I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was a great drama. I don't necessarily think it should have beaten certain things. Personally, I think killers of the plot, the flower moon was a much better film than Oppenheimer, but yeah, I mean, I, I mean, Oppenheimer aside, I think some of his other stuff gets a little blown out of proportion just because, the con conceptually he tries to go kind of really artsy not artsy but like really unique in the way he tries to tell the story mm -hmm. like there's always like a like a twist to it that makes it unique like the way he tells the story or not like interstellar um inception uh, inception yeah inception yeah i mean interstellar like it's like this backwards weird time thing inception mm -hmm. it's all in your dreams you know uh memento with the memories and how he creates that like the prestige where it's like about magic, does, but like there's other things I, going I on. Do, but. I do feel it peaks after I really started to see it after like the dark Knight. I still think is one of the best films of all time. Not even just um, a Christopher Nolan movie, but just the way that it was done. Everything about that movie was excellent. And I feel like that was the peaking point. And then I realized that my eyes started to wake up when he did the dark Knight rises. That's I'm like, what is this? Yes. Uh, what's going on here and then he does i think inception immediately afterward i'm like okay well it's a lot better but i really felt like i got robbed after the third batman movie mm -hmm. and then he just kind of like oh every, everyone's just all oh, christopher nolan christopher nolan and then every movie that comes out at paper i'm so sorry i know you really like him a lot but every movie afterward with inception it's just like okay and then when interstellar came out i was intrigued i was excited and I saw him like, this is contact for the next generation. I mean, it's just, it's exactly like the movie contact in so many different ways. And it's just like, I don't care. Like I, I really felt like the rug was pulled out from under me, but everyone else seemed to like really idolize that movie. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, good for you guys, but that's, it's not for me. I think it becomes an obsession with being a good movie and not making a good movie. Like it's so caught up in, wanting to get that prestige rather than just deciding to make a good movie <laughs> i had the prestige it, it wants that prestige yeah. <laughs> but it kind of forgets along the way of like yeah like m make a good movie like it doesn't need to necessarily be the the level that some of them are i mean i can take or leave some of them i mean i yes i loved inception i interstellar was okay i liked the batman films hot take dark knight was my least favorite of the three but like i i think so much of the reporting and stuff that i see coming out of a lot of his more recent movies is you won't believe the technology used on this or like the way that he shot this and it's not necessarily hey this is a really great movie it's oh but look at all the cool stuff involved with it i mean this, this might sound worse than i mean it but it's kind of like the M. Night Shyamalan of like a weird thing. Like instead of a twist, yeah. it's just like, here's my movie. There's a weird thing in it that's going to be really impressive. 
he wrote the well no he didn't write the line but it's one of the best lines in the dark knight where um you know harvey dent says like you know you live long enough um you either die the hero or live long enough to become the villain and that's exactly what happens apparently nolan's brother wrote it and he didn't understand it at the time like what and that was my big thing behind him just like what how the hell do you not understand what that line means because it's you're you're setting up this grand this is one of the best heroes fall stories that one could possibly tell and you don't understand what that means and how important that line ends up becoming and then he kind of gets behind it by the time you know oppenheimer comes out but just his not realizing what that means back then just is kind of alarming like dude maybe you've just been failing upwards this whole time and no one has caught on to it yet I, I love i love the idea of like that level of artistry failing upwards it's like he's making <laughs> it's like sometimes uh like i'll be working on like a, a piece of graphic design and like something i'll just be messing around with something and all of a sudden like a weird combination of like blending masks and overlays creates like this really cool effect and it's just like oh that's really neat it's it's kind of dumb but boy does it look cool <laughs> it's like should yeah. i just i should i just go with this <laughs> And sometimes it works. Mm. So, I mean, like, is he a bad director and all that? No, I just, I don't honestly see the big deal behind him. No, it's true. Like, I, I, I think I generally like all of his movies. I mean, I, I'm just not a Batman fan. So, like, I just kind of glaze over mm -hmm. on those. But, like, um, I would never, I wouldn't say any of his movies make my, like, top 10 favorite movies. But, like, you know, on my first watch, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's got a cool thing. Yeah. I think he's good at his craft and I like him. Um, but yeah, I agree. It's, I, I'm not going to cancel plans every single time just because after a while, like you said, it came to a point of, okay, so everyone is just kind of like a, here's the cool thing about this one, tenant and time works in reverse or like whatever, um, that we just keep getting. I do love that during an interview, though, he talked about like some of his favorite movies, and one of them was Talladega Nights. And it's like all of his movies he's created. And then I picture Christopher Nolan finish walking off the set of Oppenheimer, going to his trailer and <laughs> flicking on Talladega Nights. You ain't first, you're last. Like Christopher Nolan on set being like, don't put that evil on me. I do appreciate that it humanizes people because, like, I remember during that time a lot of interviewers were asking celebrities like what's your top five movies and so many of them with with like cinephile type movies and like you know really deep cut artistically made films and then you got some movie people were like i just like the good old popcorn flick like i think daisy ridley was asking she's like i love matilda i mean that's like, a good that's, movie it is but it's not on anybody's like you know top 10 most influential movies of all time list and that's what it seems like more actors seem to kind of gravitate toward and yeah. i respect that a lot like i'm glad to see that you maker of such huge movies really dislikes dumb humor of talladega nights like is that a good movie no but i yeah. enjoy the hell out of it oh yeah and when i say good i mean like in terms of just you know, it's like the there's a meme I saw of like Godzilla minus one versus um, Kong X Gorilla Godzilla. And it's like one is the best five star steak made for you by, the, uh, you know, a Michelin star chef. And then the other one is the best damn cheeseburger you'll ever have in your life. Like they cannot be compared with each other, but they both have their specific points. And that's exactly what that is. Or you can always have an actor who takes the Bruce Willis approach when he's asked what his favorite movies are. And he says, I don't watch movies. <laughs> I don't watch movies. I have movies. Oh. <laughs> or you just start listing yeah. off your own. Yeah. He's just like, I don't watch movies. It's like, what? what do you mean? Well, it's my favorite when you have like all the letterboxed interviews of them on like red carpets and things. And see the actors who get excited for it because they know what's coming of like, oh, go ahead. Like, I'm prepped for this. Ask me my five favorite films. And they start rattling stuff off. And it's not like sometimes, yeah, you'll have like some classics, you'll have some art house things, and then you'll have just a mix of random things that I think just, yes, they create movies. They're part of movies. But also at some point they just sat down and watched like, I don't know, like blue streak or something and they're like yeah i really dig this movie it's something for everybody and i think that ends up humanizing all of us 
Mm-hmm. Even Christopher Nolan. Kind of. I'm kind of curious what his other favorite movies are. I, I want to find more interviews now about people talking about their favorite movies because I think that's also just kind of a fun thought process. Like Daniel Day Lewis, what are your favorite movies? I want to know that I know, answer. <laughs> I know Willem Dafoe is a cinephile. He loves movies. He fucking loves them. Same thing with like um, Nicolas Cage. But their choices in movies are going to be like shit that we've never heard of, and yeah, it's going to be tough to follow because he is not a. Uh... <sighs> He is not a, ta- they are not Talladega Knights fans, if you know, catch my drift. Yeah, it's like, they like it for extremely specific reasons. Yeah. And now I want to see Christopher Nolan movies with a framing device. <laughs> there we go. Stop or Maldor. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll appreciate them a lot more. <laughs> oh, <laughs> a Muppet framing device. Oh, be so I, I still think um, they should make more movies now muppet style like they used to where they take out every single person replace them with muppets except for one 100 and that they tell the whole story that way like imagine saving private ryan the beach scene you know it's kermit the frog and he's looking around and he's just seeing muppet stuffing everywhere and you know just like Muppets without legs and arms and it's like that whole thing and then they get to finally you know they they take Normandy Beach you gotta save Private Ryan all the actors are still voicing their same characters except it's not Simon Pegg anymore you know it's just it's the Muppet and then they finally get to him they save Private Ryan and it's still Matt Damon in flesh and blood and he plays it exactly the same oh yeah I mean, he, I feel like he definitely could do that. I want to see Saving Private Ryan, but the only real character is still Adam Goldberg. So the one scene that everybody is like, oh no, the scene with uh, what's his name getting stabbed, and it's still Adam Goldberg, yeah. but now it's, it's by, a Muppet, by a Muppet, <laughs> while another Muppet watches. <laughs> oh, it's got to be Animal doing the stabbing, where he's like, shush, shush. <laughs> Swedish chef. <laughs> Oh, or, or I mean, I my I think my my pick for that is uh, uh, redo all the entire Harry Potter franchise and everyone's Muppets except Snape. <laughs> I say Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Leatherface is the only one we keep. Oh, that's, oh man, that should this should be a rule of third. <laughs> Your favorite movie that you want replaced entirely by Muppets? Okay, listeners, one. forget all of these picks. <laughs> oh, Superman would be good, like Man of Steel. Everyone's a Muppet except Superman. <laughs> no, just like Kevin Zack Snyder's yeah. Justice League, but only Ben Affleck's real. <laughs> oh man, these are uh, Muppets need to get their hands on more stuff like ASAP. They really, they really do, and it, I think bringing them back, it's just nobody wants to watch. Nobody talked about the um, the Mayhem show that came out. I loved it. That was one of the best unsung uh, shows that I watched. I think it was last year when it came out. I, and if was, you haven't, pl- please watch it. It was hard to find on Disney+. Plus. It was Yeah, like, they, they bury it. As someone who watches The Muppets a lot on Disney+, Plus, like I went on to Disney+, Plus and I expected it to be the top thing for me. But I had to search for it. And even when I searched for it, I had to type in the exact words. Like typing in Muppets didn't bring it up. Yeah, it's so dumb. It's very clear on what they try to pitch at the time. Mm-hmm. And unless you're watching it day one of release, by day two, it's like, no, it, it's just going to be buried with well, all the, the rest of the stuff. There was also uh, another Muppet project that was buried was um, Muppet Haunted Mansion came out, not this past Halloween, yep. but the one before. And it yeah. was great, but got totally buried. It's like a, a one hour, um, like, special like movie, i guess movie, movie thing yeah, yeah mm-hmm. and it was great it was so good it was one of my, my favorite muppet things i've seen in a while um but that one also just got totally buried and had a pretty good cast behind it too so it was really strange um it, it, yeah i'm not gonna go deep into muppet lore i was about to I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> save it for next month <laughs> and that concludes our first hot takes episode So if you like what you've heard, please drop a review, rating, and subscribe to us on Spotify, YouTube, or wherever else you get your podcast to help us out. I know everyone says this, but likes and subscribing really does help the channel out. Uh, Like I said, we do have social media, um, but I'll admit we're not good at always pushing ads and keeping us in the forefront of your thoughts. We're busy. You're busy. I, I get it. 
Um, you can still find us on Instagram at Screen Refresh. And please smash that like and subscribe button over at YouTube at the Screen Refresh Network. You can even shoot us an email at ScreenRefresh.com so we can hear what your top three choices would be or suggest other topics to make episodes on. So for Tim and David, this is Nick. You take care of yourself and you can catch us next on Rule of Thirds, airing every third Monday of the month. And also our sister podcast, Don't Open This Podcast, every second and fourth Monday of the month. So ending Stinger, I uh, I was wrong about dinner in the movie. It's actually 17 seasons. Holy God. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of dinners. <laughs>